evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of BDI to this EU industry talk on Europe at a crossroads, how do we promote our competitiveness? Delighted to welcome Siegfried Rusvorm, president of BDI, the Federation of German Industries. Also very delighted to welcome Kirsten Jona, director general for the internal market, industry, entrepreneurship, and SMEs in the European Commission, better known to us in Brussels as DG Grow. Unfortunately, Thierry Breton, the internal market commissioner who had been due to be with us for this industry talk, uh, got held up in Sweden at the meeting of defence ministers, the informal meeting of defence ministers, and then his plane was delayed. But Kirsten has stepped in, and we couldn't have anyone better to have this conversation with the president of BDI. My name is Jackie Davis. I will be taking you through the event. Uh, we will, on stage, be speaking in English. Uh, if you need an interpretation headset, they are at the back of the room. Uh, English is on one and German is on two. When I come out to the room for questions from you later on, you can use either language. Uh, I have an interpretation headset. Uh, so a very warm welcome. Great to see so many of you in the room and fabulous to have so many more online with us. Uh, before we start our talk. I am delighted to welcome to the stage Friedrich von Heusinger, who is Director of the Representation of the State of Hessen to the EU, our host this evening. Uh, so please, over to you. Vielen Dank, Jackie Davis, sehr geehrter Abgeordnete des Europäischen Parlaments, des Deutschen Bundestages und des Landtags, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident Russwurm, liebe Kerstin Jorna, sehr geehrte Frau Ministerin Martin. Signora Minister Martin, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Hessian Minister for Federal and European Affairs, Lucia Putrick, I'd like to welcome you here in the EU representation of Hess in Brussels. I'm pleased that the BDE has decided to invite us this evening in the representation of Hess. President Roswurm. I'd like to thank you and the BDI team here. Für die gute Zusammenarbeit bei der Vorbereitung dieser Veranstaltung. Gern steht Ihnen die Landesvertretung für weitere Veranstaltungen in dieser Reihe zur Verfügung. Wir freuen uns jedenfalls darauf. Meine Damen und Herren, dieses Jahr wird der Binnenmarkt 30 Jahre. Dies ist ein guter Grund zu feiern und sich der Errungenschaften zu versichern. Und die Kommission wird ja nächste Woche dazu auch etwas mitteilen. Und wenn sogar der britische Premierminister Sunak nach der Einigung mit Kommissionspräsidentin von der Leyen über die Anwendung des Nord with von der Leyen praises the internal market after the application of the Northern Ireland Protocol, then we can really be proud of our market. And the internal market is a successful project, but it's not over yet. Progress with regards to the integration of the financial services would be of utmost interest, but also in general, um, the services area. Ladies and gentlemen, energy security and energy prices are becoming more and more important because of the war. The high energy prices have led to many companies thinking about transfers uh, outside of the EU. And all of that against the background that the European Union has set itself the goal to become climate neutral by 2050 and to reduce the CO2 emissions by 55% by 2030 as an interim step. The Inflation Reduction Act of the US in this context is sort of a declaration of war directed at the EU. And the announced commission proposal of the Net Zero Industry Act is one reply uh, to the Inflation Reduction Act, and President von der Leyen is going to be speaking with President Biden on Friday. President Ruswurm, you have invited uh, to have this discussion at exactly the right time. Congratulations for this. Before I give the floor to Dr. Willems, the head of the BDI VDA representation in Brussels, I'd like to thank my team for preparing this event, Mr. Hohlefleisch, Frau Dr. Schule, Herr Golanski, and, Herr Fern and Mr. Fernane. I now look forward to the discussion between President Ruswurm and Director General Kerstin Jorna. And I'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Willems. MEPs, dear Kerstin Jorna, Mr. Ruswurm, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. von Heusinger, 
Firstly, thank you very much for your hospitality. We're very pleased to be here in Hess this evening in order to start this uh, series of events in this new format. When we planned this event, we knew that we'd be speaking about competition, how we want to promote the industry, how we're going to tackle all the climate-related challenges, and that in a very difficult context in, indeed with the energy crisis. What we didn't know is that the timing would be so incredibly apt. As you said, next week we're going to obtain proposals from the European Commission and we'll have the possibility to discuss this. And I hope that Kerstin Joanna will perhaps give us one or the other insight um, into the operating room of the European Commission. Thanks again for um, deciding to be here this evening. We did hope that we'd be able to greet the Commissioner here this evening, but his plane is on the way. It really was uh, a last minute change. So thank you very, very much uh, for jumping in and we look forward to hopefully hearing some insights. And we also look forward to discussing the matter with you, dear guests. I don't want to take uh, anything any more of, of your time because we want to t keep it, uh, what did you say, uh, tight, bright and light, uh, the discussion. And I hand over again to Jackie Davis to moderate our discussion. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, Michael. Thank you, and may I add my thanks uh, to the representation for having us here this evening. So, let's crack straight on. Delighted to welcome to the stage the President of BDI, Siegfried Ruswurm, and Kirsten Jorna, Director General, DG Grow. It's great to have you with us. The format for this is, we're just going to dive straight in. It's a talk, as the title implied. I have some questions for them, and then, as I say, I will come out to all of you in the old-fashioned way. No need to put any, write your questions. You can raise your hand, and I will come to you with the microphone a little bit later on. Um, but if I could turn to you first, President, just in terms of the context in which we're having this conversation and the title of this event, Europe at a Crossroads. We talk a lot now about turning points, about Zeitenwender. Just how much of a Zeitenwender is this? Uh, can we ever return to business as was before, before? Or do you believe things have fundamentally changed in a permanent way? Well, definitely the latter. Things have fundamentally changed on whether at all there will be a time that we approaching something close to what we believe to have until about a year ago Time will tell us, but it will not be a matter of a few years, if at all, and that's not certain, because it's, well, first and utmost, it's a lot of grief for people in Ukraine. And whenever we comment on this war, we should make that statement at the very beginning. There are people dying as we speak every day and every hour. A big exclamation mark on that one. But besides a war at our doorstep, and it's only some, well, if you're in Berlin, that's a good thousand kilometers away. If you're in Vienna, it's 500 kilometers away. A lot of our true beliefs has changed. And quoting Fukuyama, end of history, Cold War is over, many things that we believed to be true for the long run have now collapsed. Peace in Europe has collapsed. An understanding of common rules and common grounds in the civilized world has, in a way, collapsed, as Vladimir Putin put himself outside of this consensus. And it's not only that he has tried to conquer and destroy Ukraine. He has definitely destroyed the trust in a global trade system, in global interaction, he has destroyed uh, the, the food chain for many people in uh, emerging countries. We should not forget that. And while our crisis handling jointly from politics, civil society, and uh, enterprises has, in a way, shielded us and countries from the worst case scenario, which we still discussed a year ago, we should not forget what has changed in the world around us. So crossroads, Zeitenwinde is the right expression for that. And on the other side of the title, 
of our event, how do we promote our competitiveness? What do you see? That's the broad and the big challenge, this complete change in the context we're operating. What do you see as the key challenges relating to competitiveness? And then I'll come to you, Kirsten. Well, I, I think it's not, it's not coincidence that Putin has timed that uh, and, uh, in years where we are in transitional moves that need our highest energy. The decarbonization is one of the biggest undertakings that the industrialized world is doing since, well, whatever you, you want to take, 200 years or so. At the same time, we are still struggling with new technology, uh, call it digitalization, call it uh, machine learning or alike. And at the same time, at least in Western Europe, we have a demographic challenge, which was foreseeable for decades, but now kicks in literally as people of my age, of my year of birth, are going in retirement and leave a big, big uh, loophole for skilled labor. Actually, if I look at Germany, we can cross out the word skilled. It's labor shortage right, left, and center. So we are in transformational changes. And on top of that, we had a pandemic, unheard of, and then ultimately a ruler in the Kremlin who well, puts all rules aside. So yes, there is a challenge for the system of how we jointly live on Earth since a year ago. I want to delve into those issues, but Kirsten, you want to um, paint the picture for me in terms of how you see this moment and how decisive it is and what you see as the key challenges ahead. Uh, before I do it, I do want to apologize also in the name of my commissioner. Um, he really regrets not being with you today, but it was, you know, weather conditions uh, made it impossible. So you have to put up with me. <laughs> I would call it not crossroads, because it's a, it's, for me, it's more like tectonic shifts. I mean, it's moving. And it's not that we can say, OK, yesterday we were in green, tomorrow we are in blue, or the other way around. In fact, it's tectonic shifts. And different issues are shifting. Um, supply chains are shifting. Because we learned with COVID that these very, very long supply chains had very big vulnerabilities as well. And uh, so we are reconsidering our supply chains. And you are doing it as companies, but also policymakers are reconsidering it. Because when it came to, vac came to vaccines, we just didn't have them. We had to invent a solution for this. Um, there is climate change. And it's happening. We can observe it every summer. So it's happening. So there's the decarbonization challenge. Um, as you said, there is war at our borders with challenges for our physical security. And the further you go to the east, the more people and companies will tell you that this is, a, I mean, a real security, physical security challenge. And, um, and then there's also the, I mean, demography you already mentioned. I totally uh, agree with that. And then there is also democracy, because we see new technologies, we see the way decisions are being made, the way decisions are being influenced, there, there, is, a new, there is new threats. Um, and there is also new expectations uh, on the part of, uh, of, of citizens. So managing, I mean, when you have tectonic shifts in the past, uh, it led to adaptation. You know, dinosaurs came, they died, something else came. Um, so it's really managing that adaptation and that transformation and uh, being on top of it uh, rather than being driven by it. This is really the challenge. And being on top of it means you need something big. You need kind of an elephant on which you sit rather than just, you know, be some little mouse below. So the big elephant, I think, is the single market. That's how we can be on top of it. And that's how we have to use and work together to be on top of that adaptation and that transformation. We'll come back to what we need to do to strengthen it and indeed to protect it uh, from some of the pressures that it faces. But uh, if I could come back to you, uh, Siegfried Rostrom, just in terms of, of amidst these tectonic shifts, amidst this, this dramatic turning point, the focus on competitiveness. Why do we need to focus on that 
so clearly at this juncture? Well, if we look at Europe as a whole, as a matter of fact, it's not our military strength by any means that gives us a right to play in the global scene. I, I would not necessarily say, say that this is a bad one. Uh, our economic strength is the biggest argument that we have. And to continue with your picture, if we don't want to be the mouse, but at least at eyes level with other global powers, we should really consider what qualifies us to play in this league. And it can only be our economic strength, which translates into competitiveness versus other powerhouses on the globe. And this alone should motivate us to do everything as a united Europe in order to be on ice level. Otherwise, we are on the role of the mouse and we should not consider too much on whether this is a good role, although the mice survived while the dinosaurs died. But we cannot trust the same to occur again. So At better... the risk of overextending the elephant-mouse analogy, which I will probably do now, um, let us focus on the issue that is raising concerns uh, that we may become uh, more of a mouse. Uh, and that is, and, you, and it was mentioned by Mr. Heusinger right at the beginning, uh, the US Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and the debate now about how does Europe respond? Does it respond um, by using its economic might to retaliate, if you like, so we end off in a subsidy race, a subsidy war, or trade retaliation of some form, or some form of bi European Act, or does it respond by trying to negotiate with the Americans to be treated um, as openly as possible, but also on these competitiveness issues? What's the right way, do you think, to respond to this? Same question to you both. Do you want to start, Kassim? <laughs> okay. Um, well, it, it's definitely worthwhile to look a little bit closer what this uh, inflation reduction is over and beyond the money. And sometimes we tend to just discuss hundreds of uh, billions of dollars and reduce the discussion to that. Yes, there is a monetary aspect in that. But over and beyond, it is a masterpiece of U.S. policymaking and politics, both in economic perspective and in ecological perspective. It is a green deal for the United States. It is internal social politics around that. So it's combining a lot of perspectives. And uh, over and beyond the money, there are some smart aspects which could give an example. The tax redemptions, for example, the reliable framework. You know upfront, if I'm producing green hydrogen, this is the support that I get per megawatt hour or per kilogram or whatever you have. Uh, fast decision making. So there are some aspects which we should keep in mind if we try to figure out what should be our reaction. So my first answer is, let's see what we can learn from the US Americans in order to support their economy, number one. Secondly, as frankly, we are bound to our transatlantic partnership. We have no alternative. There is no equidistancy for that sake to China and the United States. Let's try and find amicable solutions. Respecting the purpose of the IRA, yes, it is a support program for US economy. Respecting that we still can and should negotiate and find ways that US policymaking considers us as friends. Now that we regret that we don't have a trade agreement, all of a sudden people who were worried about the way how to conserve poultry meat, yep. have seen, well, if we had a trade agreement now with the United States that puts us on the same level as Mexico and Canada, it wouldn't be too bad. So let's use that momentum and see where we can come So from. that's an area of focus for the longer term, perhaps. But Kirsten, right now, um, a masterpiece of US policymaking. Is that how you would see the Inflation Reduction Act? And is it a case of, therefore, if you do, we need to copy it. We need to do similar things, which raises all, raises all those issues around uh, state aid and so on. Uh, or do we need to focus on other things? Well, how do you read it? Well, first of all, I don't like the way the debate is framed, that we have to respond to the IRA. In fact, we did a lot of things before. What the US does, and is very smart, is they work on a business case. 
and they bring out, it's this, the starting point for their policy is the business case. They come up with smart solutions, but also with less smart solutions. And I mean, honestly, the $3 per kilo hydrogen is pretty stupid. I mean, I call it the butter premium because that's what we did with butter and, and, and milk in the past. And it did not lead us to very good policy results. So it's about the business case. And when we look at the business cases they have on um, batteries, on hydrogen, on solar panels, and if we look then at the business case in Europe, I mean, this looks pretty good as well. Only, maybe, we're not communicating it in a good enough way. Because the business case for each, for all of these technologies is to have technology, to have input and energy, to have skills, to have access to capital and access to market. And the EU system starts there. What we have to do now is, that's something we can copy, to start with a business case. And without presenting any secrets and refusing anyhow if you ask questions to, co to comment any leaks, um, what you will see next week is that we start with a business case. Um, on clean technology, if I want to increase my production on batteries, I need access to land, I need access to uh, inputs, I need ex and in energy in particular, I need access to people who can actually do it, and I need access to market somebody who buys my green products. And when it comes access to land, it's dramatic, it's the permitting. Um, and uh, today you have a kind of blätterteich, um, millefeuille of permitting, and between 20 and 50 permits per, per installation. That's crazy. And every single authority has a veto right. And they give that, right, that veto or not at different time, moments in time. So, and that's, nesh, that's European, national, regional, and local level. That's not normal. We can do better. Now, we, that's where the discussion and the painful discussion will be. You know, can we be as if, can we say certain deadlines? Can we see single contact point? Can we say, uh, if you don't get your act together, then it's, then it's approved? Um, dramatic uh, things. And the, uh, we have never had a debate about implementation of laws in the past 30 years of the single market. We talked about rules at EU level, and the rest was subsidiarity. And that's where you know, this mushrooming of, of, of procedures and rules has actually happened. Now, looking at that is one chunk. Access to capital, I don't expect to be a lot of money in what we do, so, but I expect highways to money, to different financing. Um, and, and honestly, a business case is not built on state aid. My commissioner says that all the time. A business case is built on the better technology, the people who can do it. So when I look at skills, I mean, for batteries, 800,000 people are, are, are lacking. On solar panels, installing a solar panel means you need, means you need to know how to, to cover a roof, and you need, you need to be an electrician. Now, if you need to be these two things, uh, we will always have a shortage. Now, how can you define what a solar panel installer actually has to do? And some member states have started doing this. But when that person goes to another member state and says, I know how to install, no, 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 you have to, uh, our rules, and so No portability of these qualifications. That's where we have to start, and that's where the single market can also play a role. So overall, IRA, I don't think it's about we respond and we complain, and uh, I mean, some things have to be corrected. They are just not, you don't do that uh, among friends, but overall, you know, our business case is pretty good. And when it comes to money, sorry, that's the last point, there is at least as much public money around in Europe. It's not so accessible sometimes. Not so I want to come back on that question of access to finance in a moment. But you say we shouldn't be talking in terms of responding. But we, we have... We have had the commissioner, Thierry Breton, said in a blog he wrote uh, in the autumn of last year, it is high time, he said, that we show more assertiveness to defend our strategic interests. So it is a response. Um, I'm not quite sure why, why you have a concern about framing it that way. I mean, we had the Green Deal long before the Americans even right. knew what, uh, you know, electric vehicle is, or hydrogen. So uh, we had a Green Deal. 
we had a frame, we have a climate law that actually, I mean, if I were an investor, that's where I would go because there's predictability. They have a law. Uh, it helps. Uh, we no. have uh, the Fit for 55 package on this. We have definitions for the products that we want to see. We have incentives for circularity because the cheapest raw material is the one you can actually recycle. Um, so the, when it comes to the business case, it's pretty good in Europe. Um, uh, and, um, and we also have, through the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, actually a lot of money. We have two little projects. We have too much money for the projects we have. That's so we will get details of the Net Zero Industry Act next week. We already have the industrial plan, so we know the broad context, and you've pointed there to the thrust of the way it will go. Siegfried, do you think it is headed in the right direction? Is it focusing, this focus on manufacturing capacities, on access to land, access to finance, and so on? Is that the right focus? I like the structure that, that you put out. So it is the right direction. There are some aspects where I would respectfully disagree, uh, there is a difference to the butter example. Uh, the, the Americans make green energy carriers cheaper. We have decided to make brown energy carriers more expensive with the CO2 uh, price. Both leads to the same motivational difference between the two, de uh, to the two technologies. The difference is when you talk about global competitiveness, Selling your product to Brazil for that sake, definitely the one is cheaper where you have lowered the price for green rather than you have lifted the price for brown, for that part of brown that we cannot yet uh, change uh, to green. So there, there is a difference and therefore I would say the business case, taking your words, in the United States is better and that's what entrepreneurs tell me all over Central Europe. Yes, and yeah. I know you want to jump in. Yeah. Go. I would like to <laughs> jump in because on hydrogen, just let's take hydrogen. So $3 per kilo. But there is no way uh, that you can get your hydrogen to someone who needs it because the hydrogen gets, needs to get to the factory gate. So how do you do that in the US? Nobody knows how to transport hydrogen. Um, uh, you can put it back into ammonia and then you crack it back from ammonia into hydrogen. This this kind of operation you can do in Europe with the Hydrogen Alliance, we've, and, and the project that we have, we've thought about transport as well. We've thought about st uh, standards for transport, European standards, how to transport it safely. We've thought about purity. You know, if you're a steel maker, a chemical industry, you need different types of purity for the hydrogen. So here we have standards. All of this together makes the business case for hydrogen. Even if I get $3 for my hydrogen, which is probably even more than it costs me to produce it. But who do I sell it to? And that's why I say it's a bit like the butter. Can I just come to the question of state aids? Um, because you were talking there about high waste money and saying there is plenty of money. But of course, we now have this debate and the Commission is consulting member states on uh, a new framework uh, for state aid, to calling it the temporary state aid crisis and transition framework. And there is a big debate now uh, about not necessarily how much money, but where it comes from. Because if you leave it at the national level, the argument is we don't have, you talked about the single market being our biggest prize. A fear, and a fear particularly that Germany and France have the deeper pockets, will support their industries in a way that gives them an unfair competitive advantage, that the single market will be eroded, that we are unleveling the playing field. How do you see that? I mean, the, the, the European Council, the EU summit, talked about temporary and targeted uh, flexibility in the rules. But we've had others, including the Commissioner, say, we can't just do short-term fixes, we need longer-term measures. Kirsten, how do you see that debate? Well, it's clear. I, I prefer, and maybe my word, highway to the money was, was not the good word, highway to de-risking. We need to de-risk the projects, and there are different tools to de-risk. Uh, one is to give a, a, a grant uh, for for building the thing, another for operating it, uh, <coughs> or taking or doing a guarantee, um, like we do in under Invest EU. But the, uh, the 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 problem is that we need more renewable energy everywhere. I saw a group of Finnish entrepreneurs today and they have solved the energy problem. And their energy price is lower than the US energy price. 
uh, because they have this vision uh, 2035, completely decarbonized economy. So there's a lot of investment, including in nuclear, but you know they are decarbonized. And uh, so it's really the bridge, how we get to there, that we have to do. And um, of course, we have to deploy massively uh, wind, uh, heat pumps, uh, all these technologies. But we also need them to deploy them, because if we don't have them and we don't manufacture them, and we have resilient supply chains, we create another dependency. So this is where um, de-risking of some of the parts, in particular the new technology parts, are important. And where we have to look at all the different possible funds, but they have to be aligned. Uh, I mean, it would be easy if countries gave us more money in our EU budget, because then you have the alignment functionality and the single market functionality integrated into what we're doing. Um, we have the innovation fund, we have invest in you, we have structural funds, uh, cohesion money, we have just transition fund money, we have the recovery and resilience. Uh, so we have a lot, but we are trying to align it. And on the recovery and resilience, and that will be uh, a challenge also then uh, with, the, uh, with the legislator, we are trying through the regulation to align what member states do. And state aid is a bit the same, alignment function where national uh, money is being spent. I want to come back on that EU money versus national money in a moment, but on this broad concern, Siegfried, about a potential threat to the single market, do you see a danger here? Uh, or do you believe that in order to, I mean, there was a particular concern over the 200 um, billion euro German energy relief package uh, sparked, I think you would probably say it was misinterpreted or misunderstood uh, at the EU end, how what that money was being used for. But more broadly, this concern that countries like yours um, have a lot of money, can put a lot of money into their companies, and we now have a genuine threat to the single market. Would you, what would you say to allay those concerns, or do you share them? I understand those concerns. I do think from the way how this doppelwumms was spent, uh, it's not substantiated, but I do understand the perception about that. But underlying is, frankly, a lack of trust. I would love to see much more of that homogeneous single market in the finance area, in regulation, in digital, where scale does matter more than anything else. So I'm a, a clear defendant of more of a single market. On the other hand, I do observe that there is obviously a lack of trust between the member states, be it a lack of trust of having two deep pockets and only subsidizing your own industry in the one direction, or a lack of trust that this money would be spent wisely rather than just used to continue the not most prudent practice of the past, to put it politely. So the, the underlying problem is a lack of trust between the member states. So we can argue for a more homogeneous Europe if we can't resolve that lack of trust, we, we are fighting against the water flow. Yeah, uh, and just, and I'm gonna come out to all of you because I want to turn to broader issues of competitiveness after this, not focusing solely on the green tech, clean tech and, and, and the green transition, uh, but just on this question of, of EU money. As you said, there are lots of sources. We have Repower EU, Invest EU, the Innovation Fund, Recovery and Resilience Facility, but there is an argument that says, if we do it, through the European level, we overcome the problem of the lack of trust. And you were pointing to that when you said alignment, we could mm. do it. What do you say, where do you come down, Kirsten, on the discussion now about doing it through the European level? And if we do take the European Sovereignty Fund, where should we focus? What should we do with it? We should focus on getting the energy prices down by bringing up renewable energy. This, this is, I mean, the transformation of our industry goes essentially via electrification. And for that, you need green energy. And you need green energy 24-7 at the factory gate. Because green energy, you have it where the sun shines and the wind blows, but that's not normally where you have the industry. So you have to organize the grid, you have to organize the transport, you have to organize the storage you have to organize the baseload. Uh, and that's the challenge that we, we have. 
and a big sort of at European level, uh, or is it okay to do it at the national level? Well, I mean, it makes sense when you have a policy at the level of the single market that you have the means at the level of the single market as well. So a bigger EU budget would, per definition, carry this alignment function. Now, if you if that's not wanted, we have two ways. One is the recovery and resilience way, which is we tap the market and we distribute it. And we have an alignment filter, yeah. which is the regulation. Or uh, we have other alignment instruments, um, such as uh, InvestEU, such as uh, cohesion policy, such as just transition policy, uh, regulation. Um, such as state aid, but then we always have to look at this alignment function so that together we create the public good for the single market. Siegfried, I don't know whether you have a position on whether uh, this should be done more to, to overcome that lack of trust you talked about. Is it a solution to do it at European level? But I do think you have issues about how easy it is to access the money uh, well, that comes from well, the European level. Well, two aspects. One is another argument for a truly pan-European approach. You talked about where is the green energy and, so to speak, where to harvest that. We have opportunities within the Union. Mm -hmm. We have all of a sudden an opportunity for the Mediterranean or south of Rome, where uh, we, we have been discussing how to support this region for decades, and all of a sudden they are blessed with much more sun and some wind compared to Middle Europe. We have an opportunity for the Estremadura in Spain with similar conditions. So if we really look at things from a holistic European perspective, this gives opportunity. The lack of trust is a lack, of, a monetarian lack of trust, so to speak. And we have to overcome that in order to think big as a, a true competitor, Europe as a true competitor against other centers of gravity on the globe. But that leads us to global competitiveness, obviously. And in terms of, of accessing the money that's available, because Kristen's saying, it's there, there is money available, we need the projects. But I think sometimes from business you hear, it may be there, but it's it's not as easy to get as it may be for yeah, companies in the US. It's sometimes difficult to foresee in this complex regulation on whether you are qualified for that. And we have, there are some details over the last month, you can talk about this double wombs and the 200 billions in Germany back and forth. Uh, I have the doubtful pleasure to be in the commission to make a suggestion for this state aid. We were out for a fast and predictable regulation against the spikes, by the way. Yeah. We did not want to subsidize that to the old price. And then comes the aftermath of an EU temporary crisis framework that says, okay, but you're only eligible if your EBDA goes down by 40%. Well, I know my EBDA 18 months after my fiscal year has started. This is a, a period of uncertainty. We have big uh, transformational projects in our basic industry. We are talking about hundreds of millions of subsidies. The only open question is, is this accepted uh, by the Commission as a state aid? And that kind of uncertainty is poisonous for the business case. Because it can be as attractive if my risk better that I have to multiply, I don't know for sure, mm -hmm. is over and beyond one, it's getting difficult. So the, the sheer complexity okay. of, the, of yeah. even about the many programs, to be quite honest, when I'm here in Brussels and have my experts here, they can help me to navigate through all these different programs. If you put yourself in the shoes of a, of a mid-sized entrepreneur, how could I navigate through all these programs or to turn it around? Is there anybody within the commission that draws a map or, or unifies I that? Got, I've got to give Kirsten a chance to respond and then I'll come out to all of you. Kirsten, briefly, if you would. Yeah, so um, I think tectonic shifts means also shifting, you know, where is a job better done? Vaccines. We had to buy the vaccines. Europe had to buy the vaccines. Because if member states had been bidding against each other, fighting against each other, there would have been citizens in Europe without a vaccine. And um, so th there is also a shift. And now if we have such a shift, 
we have to think how we give the means to act. And, uh, and, and that's a new, a new context, a new phrasing of the debate. And, the, and rather than saying, you know, I'm against the Commission or the EU taking money on the market, horrible. I'm against uh, giving money to the EU, horrible. Um, that's not the debate we need to continue. We need to rethink the terms of our debate and alignment of different sources of money, of, of, of funding for business projects requires a new thinking. And we have to need a thinking where we look EU budget, I mean the blending, EU budget, national budgets, something in between budget, guarantees, how it comes together. On your question, um, when we reorganized DG Grow, I uh, created uh, a directorate on investment. And everybody said, huh? Hey, single market? What do you need investment? But in that, we look at private capital, access to private money, access to public money, public procurement, and collaterals. And how all and we pull it together. are interconnected. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Does anyone want to join this discussion? Or are you happy for me to go on grilling our wonderful speakers? <laughs> yes. Let me come down to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bernd Lange, the chair of the International Trade Committee. I have a slightly different view on the Inflation Reduction Act. I guess it's really a war of competition, which has been started by the Congress of the United States. With some positive elements, you mentioned this in the U.S. well, the, the climate change uh, strategy is now clear. They want to reduce uh, until 2030 for 40% CO2 and so on. And they have positive elements in like good wages for uh, subsidies and uh, also quotas for qualification. This is also important. By the way, I expect this should come from the Commission as well. But the negative element is the violation of international law, of WTO law. So my question is, should we do the same or do we go in a different direction? So my personal view, of course, is the answer to America first can't be Europe first. It has to be Europe fast. And there we have the problem. Uh, approval of uh, IPSI hydrogen takes one and a half year. Mm. A state aid approval in Hamburg takes one year. The preparing of an agreement with Chile, where we get some raw materials from, takes one year. So Europe has to be fast, faster as today. Um, I'll give you a chance to respond to that in a moment. Anybody else want to join in the conversation? Thank you very much, sir. Christian Ehler, coordinator in the ITRE committee. Uh, to Ms. Jona, the interesting although you don't commit, comment leaked proposals, is the deregulation is directing to the member states. What about deregulation of the European level? We're doing an industry emission directive, we have a corporate due diligence, uh, we go to regulate PFAS, uh, we want to have a new reach. I mean, we're adding to the, to the, we've talked about the CAPEX issue, but we're adding to the OPEX cost the utmost. So can we have it all, climate change, and every kind of relation, regulation reliable to pollution, to other ambitions. Does that work? Thank you very much indeed. Any others before I come back? Okay. Kirsten, perhaps we'll pick up on that one directly first, and then we'll come back on the response to the US. Yes. Of course, yes, we can, because that's where the competitiveness is. And uh, it gives predictability to investors. Now. Uh, how far we go and how the legislative process also adds to the, I mean, what you call OPEX cost, I would call compliance cost. Um, that's where we have to look and how we, uh, how we implement it. But if we don't give investor security, uh, then, the, then it's clear that the business case is a better business case in the US. In the, U, in the EU, having a legal framework that defines and uh, frames the transition that, for example, says batteries sold in the EU, they have to be of a certain quality, they have to be, that you can exchange them. That gives investor security. Uh, we are currently consulting on eco design uh, for solar panels. Having specifications for how solar panels should look gives investor security and gives scale to a market to scale up. 
uh, I said, I don't think it's, you know, it's the if, it's the how. And on the how, uh, collectively, can, we can improve. The commission makes SME tests, competitiveness tests, when we do the impact assessments, when we do the proposal. But when it goes through the legislator, and I totally agree with you, in the council, legislation is driven by lack of trust. And difficult access to finance is because the member states don't trust each other, and so they put a lot of locks before you can actually access the funds. So um, that adds up. But at that stage, nobody looks into, um, into the, you know, the cost for business. And I'm sorry, but you know, I've been attending a lot of trilogues recently, and uh, the easy compromise when Parliament and Council don't agree is we make a report, Commission make a report. <clears throat> so, you know, you have the monument in there. Um, I, you know, I, at this point, uh, they have to make a report about it. But if we make a report, we have to ask companies for the information. And that adds up. And we have many reports in difficult okay. trilogues recently. Okay. On the issue raised by Mr. Langer uh, and the response and coming back uh, to that issue, but I also wanted to broaden it out because one of the pillars of the Green Deal Industrial Plan is open trade for resilient supply chains. Um, so specifically to the US response degree, but also on this broader issue of where we go from here. You mentioned at the beginning the importance of, uh, and if we had a, a, an agreement with the US, we might be in a different position now. Um, how do you see the way ahead? Because uh, I want to broaden this out, not just to the green, but beyond that. So specifically the response to the US, but more broadly on this issue of open trade. Well, one fundamental belief that I would like to share is that the referee in competition is the customer. So we have to put more emphasis on what is the global customer. So when we're talking global trade and global competition, what, how do our global customers evaluate that? And we may or may not like it that for them, the cost of doing business with us Europeans, so paying for our components, is an important aspect. So we need to find a good balance for not jeopardizing our principle, our core beliefs on how responsible business should be conducted. But at the same time, keep an eye on that, that this referee out there, whether it's in South America or in Southeast Asia, has a look at the cost as well. So frankly, my answer is, if you have the choice, take both, have an eye on cost, and accept the compromise. There is usually more things that we would desire at the same time than what we can achieve. So the balance to say, well, where do we compromise? Is the 100% goal achievable? Or is it better for the total change to be at 95%? Mm. Or is, the, is, is carbon uh, capture and storage, is this an acceptable compromise rather going for purity we shouldn't have carbon dioxide in the first place. Mm. Here I see, uh, interestingly enough, especially in Germany, an interesting shift towards this compromise. Mm. The apodictic, we have to do everything comprehensively. We have to have every trade agreement comprehensive, i.e. covering each and everything that we would like to achieve as a precondition. Mm. This is a risky path, at least, and I believe it's not the optimum that we should strive for. And I'm not going to ask Kirsten to comment on leaks about uh, the, the act, but there is one thing, um, one inference we have heard suggestions that there may be some element of by European to respond to the by US. Um, I won't ask you to confirm or deny that, but if there was, is that the right way forward, do you think? I'm worried about that uh, for various reasons. I'm worried about retaliation. Uh, whether or not uh, WTO is working or not, you could have some doubts on whether this is still functioning. But one thing is for sure, if you put up trade barriers, there's typically a reaction from the other side. So uh, the retaliation needs to be factored into our considerations. And secondly, I'm, I'm chronically skeptical about companies doing things just because we want them to do that. So we, we want... Well, we want to produce X percent of our windmills in Europe. Mm. 
My first question is, who is we in that respect? With all due respect for Brussels, I don't expect that Brussels is producing these things. <laughs> so again, we are at a business case. Is there a business case for investors that says, okay, this is so attractive and so reliable, I put my money onto that business case. Um, um, I, I can accept the targets, yep. but I do know these targets will only materialize if there is a business case, because otherwise, again, you are fighting against the flow of water, and that's not... Indeed. Uh, and Kirsten, uh, I mentioned uh, this one of the pillars of the Green Deal Industrial Plan, and it talks about networks of free trade agreements, uh, a critical raw materials club, uh, partnerships, uh, and so on. How do you see, and, and do you share the concern uh, that we risk going down? I won't ask you, as I say, to comment on, on the suggestion that there's something in the Net Zero Act, but more broadly, how do we maintain open trade in this current climate of mistrust uh, and division? Well, again, I think it's about framing the debate. It's not by America or by Europe and, uh, or free trade. What we have to look at is, again, the business case. Now, the business case for magnesium, I make as an example. Uh, a year ago, uh, China said from one day to the other, sorry, guys, no magnesium for you anymore. Um, and car industry, all the industries, machine industry that use metals and they need that as an alloy. My God, and the governments have to pay uh, for, 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 for short-term worker relief. And so we went and we said, okay, that's a conundrum. Let's go to the seven countries that have magnesium mines, that know how to refine magnesium, it's also not obvious. And to, so we talked to them, they were ready to engage. And then they said, yeah, but it has to be a business case for us. And the business case is that the car industry or those who need uh, metals actually agree to buy this magnesium. So we went back to, the, to these industries and said, would you buy the magnesium? And then they said, yeah, 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 of course, of course, we need it now. But then they said, okay. you know, when it comes from China again, oh, you know, my shareholders, so my board, um, no, I mean, then, you know, they couldn't engage. So... That, I would say, is not a sustainable business case. So instead of saying buy Europe, buy Europe, let's talk about dependency and diversification. Let's talk about resilience of the supply chain. And uh, that's when you get to solutions that is a win-win. That's a business case for uh, which, those who do the metal and the refining yeah. and those who use it. And I do want to say a word, uh, Mr. Langen, <laughs> Of course, the parts, and I said that in what I said before, uh, in the IRA that are unfriendly, uh, uh, as you describe, they are not okay. And we have to correct that. Um, that that's obviously for sure. Very quick, I want to touch on two more issues uh, before we close, and I do want to finish on time. Strategic autonomy. Uh, and what is called open strategic autonomy. I always wonder what the open bit means in that expression and whether it's a bit of a tautology, but that's maybe my cynicism. Um, do you, what do you make of this debate, Siegfried, um, that Europe is having? Is it a real... I mean, what does it actually mean to you in economic terms? And how realistic is it? Um, are they on the right track with this emphasis on strategic autonomy? Well, I have my understanding for that, but I'm afraid that we not yet have a common understanding, right. um, at least all over Europe, what that is. And as long as we don't have a common understanding, we can't put a price tag on that because it does not come for free. And your magnesium example is exactly that. I plead guilty on my own behalf. We had an initiative to get to neodymium, magnetic rare earth material, and then the Chinese, it was about 19, uh, 2015, the Chinese lowered the price to 25% and the business case collapsed. Would we have factored in strategic autonomy or sovereignty, uh, our conduct would have been different. So I, I plead guilty on my own behalf. My definition is nobody can blackmail us. It's not about autarky. It's not about narrow-minded, we go back to the 1950s where everything was so cozy, yep. which it wasn't. It's more about where can anybody on this globe blackmail us? And what can we do in, in that interpretation of resilience not to be blackmailed. And all of a sudden, in the menu of solutions, there is diversification, yeah. there is partnerships, there is investment, there is long-term commitments in that, 
we have to have that broad view and we have to accept it has a price tag. Okay. Is that your interpretation of what it means? I, I, I agree with that interpretation and I want to insist on strategic partnerships. Uh, and you asked the question before. The strategic partnerships, for example, on raw materials, we have now six. And these partnerships, they are long term. They're not, you know, give me your raw materials and then goodbye. It's actually working with a global gateway context, with our development money, which is not little, uh, to help develop the economy in these partner countries around concrete projects. And that means uh, bringing technology, skilling on site, uh, helping to move up the value chain, not only extraction, but also uh, uh, refining, possibly recycling, possibly skills partnerships, uh, and, and also money. Uh, EIB, uh, development money, national money, the Team Europe approach. So that is a long-term engagement on both sides. And uh, that's, I think, what is at the bottom of this concept of open strategic autonomy, having predictability and reliable supply chains for our economy. One other issue I wanted to touch on, which is the other issue you may, mentioned at the beginning as a big challenge, the demography, mm -hmm. the demographic challenge, uh, and the challenge for labour and the challenge for skilled labour. Um, how do you see the way forward? And, I mean, it is a debate when you, ever you talk about immigration at EU level. It is probably um, the most difficult issue. It's politically, you talked about a lack of trust. We see it there more than perhaps in any other area. What's the way forward, Siegfried? There is not one silver bullet for the way forward. We need a full spectrum of activities. I do believe that we need a targeted immigration, but I know that not all member states and governments would agree to that. We need to enable human beings, in brackets, maybe more female, to engage more in value add, we need to motivate people that work is a valuable part of their life rather than saying, well, work-life balance means if I go to work, I end living. And when I leave my office at 5 o'clock or my workbench, I start living again. I find that nonsense and we have to counteract that. But one element which I would like to add to that discussion, which is not that frequent, is administrative work, proving that I am doing things right and having somebody to check that is, the Japanese would call that muda. It's waste. It doesn't create value. It just occupies people. So when we lower the administrative burden, we are freeing up resources, hopefully for more productive work and fighting the demographic change. So we need them all. And, not just, and just on the skills aspect of that, there is talk, and again, you may not want to comment on, on a net zero industries academy to focus on the skills issue. Um, how do you see the EU's role in, in making sure that we have the skills we need, Kirsten? Very briefly, because I want to put you both on the spot before we close. Um, we, we need skills, but it's not in Brussels or in any office for that matter that we can define what skills are needed. What we need is a process where companies and workers have a permanent dialogue, what skills need, how they need to adapt it. We can provide, uh, you know, facilitate this process by, uh, by academies and, you know, the, the, there's the Battery Academy, well, the Solar Academy, which is modules, but it's also uh, uh, mobility and portability of my skills that I can go somewhere. And uh, yeah. honestly, when I look at services, uh, the provision of services, there is so much going wrong between the member states and so many administration. Um, we, in our single market enforcement task force, where we hold up the, mi the mirror to member states and say, you know, in a certain sector, this is what we see in terms of procedures. It's full. Um, we identified 800 crazy rules on professional qualifications, yeah. uh, where member states were only collecting money, only keeping business models away, you know, like the engineer repairing the machine. Um, and we reduced uh, 300. Member states, you know, accepted that 300 had to be reduced. On permitting for, uh, for renewable energy, we are now removed 80 
of really stupid administrative procedures. So really like just going through systematically. Going through systematically. Yeah. And because it's Women's Day today, International Women's Day, I want to make one example of one woman who in her own self removed huge problems for services. Mrs. Graziana Luisi, who could not travel abroad because the Italian government said you can only take that money and that was not enough. She went to the court and she said, free movement of services does not only mean providing services, means also receiving services. And the court says, you're right. So she, by insisting, she created, you know, a huge right to receive services uh, and for service provision in the EU, where a lot of men in a lot of meetings, and also some women, actually failed <laughs> to do it. And when they fail to do it, then there are even more men and women in all the local administrations in the member states who see, think they have a license okay. to print no new. Okay, I want to put you both on the spot now. And I want to come back to the title of our event, Europe at a Crossroads: how do we promote our competitiveness and your elephant and mouse analogy that we started with. If we are to ensure that we are an elephant in this world, uh, and you made the point, Siegfried, about our economic might uh, is our biggest asset. For you, a key priority as we face these challenges, one for you and one for him. So what do you want from industry? to help achieve this. And the other way around to you, Siegfried, what does industry need to do and what do you want from her? So, Kirsten, a priority for you and a priority for him. Priority for me is that we define the business case together. I mean, that you tell us what your business case is and that we define who does what and how do we get to the transformation 2030. That's what we call transformation pathways. And having the thinking in terms of business case uh, rather than I regulate, you do something, and then, you know, it doesn't work. It's really to have this conversation and not you saying to us, oh, what do you know about the business case? Well, we know not your business case, and you, your bet, you know better, but we have a little interesting single market toolbox where we can actually help and promote and scale it to the European level. Priority for industry and a priority for policymakers, Kirsten, the Commissioner, and all. Well, first request granted, <laughs> uh, but connected with the connotation, trust us when our arguments about what makes the business case more positive or more negative are not selfish. And sometimes we have that feeling, we are making our arguments and it is, it is connotated, you, you just want to make more profit. Well, you could translate the sentence into, we want to have a better business case in global competition. So a mutual trust between policymakers and those who apply these policies in, in the real business case versus the global referee, the customer, uh, would definitely be helpful and would take away a lot of muda and waste and complication in our joint conduct. I wish we could go on talking for hours. Uh, it has been absolutely wonderful. Will you join me in thanking uh, them both very much indeed for a great conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can I also... <laughs> Can I also thank... Um, Hessen for having us here this evening. Can I thank our interpreters for doing such sterling work? Uh, and most of all, thank you to all of you for coming and joining us, whether you are here in the room with us or watching online. And your reward, I'm sorry to those watching online, but for those who are here, your reward awaits. Uh, there are drinks and food being served outside. Do stay if you can. We'd love to have you with us. And to those watching online, bon appetit, whatever you're eating. Thank you so much and good night.